Well, once again, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Yeah? Good. Good. Awake? How was breakfast? Not so much. Hot water? Did the hot water work? Yes. yes. Mine didn't. But that's okay. I'm even more alert and awake this morning. Uh, good morning again. We are four educators from Houston, Texas. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Should I turn it up, down? Guys in the back, we're okay? Awesome. We're four educators. Really excited uh, to join you today uh, from Houston, Texas. Uh, that draw from a variety of experiences. I am an administrator in our school. Uh, we've got a choral person, an elementary person, an orchestra person, and we've got a number of other members from our school too. Wave your hand, guys. Happy to be here. Um, we're glad you're here because we plan to spend the next 50 minutes exploring some really exciting possibilities with music in your schools and in your programs. Today is an adventure. And as we uncover areas of technology that we learned, we're going to make your job easier, more fun, and more productive. Also, we're gonna share with you how to replicate everything that we've done during our preparations. We've created a number of YouTube sites. You're gonna get some email addresses. Hopefully you've got a, a handout on the way in. And we encourage you to use anything you see today. Take it and use it uh, with your students and within your school communities. Here are some of the slides and from some of the sites that we've created that we're gonna talk about throughout the morning that we think are gonna be very helpful for you and your programs. But before being tech savvy teachers, we were really eager, not very tech savvy teachers. Anyone relate to that? All right, good. Nice to see there's a few of you out there. Uh, the tech is only a tool. We use the tech to enrich our learning, to enhance our music, and to ignite imaginations. You're gonna walk away from here in the next 50 minutes being able to use YouTube to change the culture of your school. How to improvise and lead students in your schools without ever taking a special class. What's the best way to spend $100 this year from your budget? And maybe even less. Using smart music and computer-aided technology. Fitting all of your musical tools in your back pocket, literally. We're gonna talk a little bit about tech etiquette, and also how to seriously let the tech do the talking that allows you to free up your time to make music more. We're gonna talk a little bit about developing an ensemble of individual achievers that helps you personalize your instruction. We're also gonna talk a little bit for those of you trying to climb the ladder about stepping up and how to join the administrative conversations at your school. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we're gonna talk about the value of your professional dreams. One of the most important <coughs> assets you have here. We're gonna share with you one of ours as well this morning and how technology can really put wind in your sail. So we invite you to sit back, relax, let go of any anxieties that you have about technology to join the conversation that music educators are talking about more seriously than ever. Can we positively shape the lives of each and every child? And how can technology help us to do that? So next person speaking this morning is one of my colleagues, the choir director, Mr. Brian Vaughn. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We, uh, every time I come to TMEA, I'm always looking for that one little nugget, that one thing that I'm gonna take back into my classroom Monday morning that's going to make my life that much better. Sometimes there are way, way, way too many of them to possibly use. Sometimes it's just that one kernel of truth that makes such a difference. And so today we're gonna to be talking about some Monday morning money makers, some ways to save money for you uh, that are going to help you in your budgeting and everything else. If, you're, uh, if you've ever been in the Houston area, you're very familiar with our friend, our friend, Mattress Mac, Jim McInvale, who talks about he's going to save you money today. And so that's what we're going to attempt to do with talking about some Monday morning money makers. So the first thing we need to do is take a little bit of stock of what do you have in terms of technology? What are some of the things that you've got? Well, you probably got a tuner, <coughs> metronome, keyboard of some kind, acoustic or electric. You've got a computer, no doubt, by this point. You got a smartphone. Most of everybody in the room is probably going to have a smartphone at their uh, accessibility. You've got some kind of recording software and, and equipment, whether that's something that's computer, or whether that's uh, you know mixing boards and cables and mics and stands and all that stuff. You probably got something that you're working with. We're gonna show you how to make that even better. You also have some kind of notation software, no doubt, whether it's Finale or Sibelius or Finale Notepad, which is the free version. Uh, and then you most uh, have a photocopier that you're going to use in strict compliance with all ethical guidelines. <laughs> yes. So those are the things that you probably already have. So now let's talk about what you need. Well, you need all of those things and more, but that's a lot of stuff. So let's think about some ways that we're going to get you from one to the other. So we're gonna talk about the best $100 you're gonna spend this year. 
Now, smart music is something that is pretty much everybody's aware of smart music these days. And we're going to talk in a later segment about why that's the best $36 you could spend for the annual subscription for smart music. And why that is not just for your students, but for yourself as well. In thinking about recording, we all want to record our students. We all want to have a record of what they do. And one of the most important things that I've found is to have a microphone for that. Okay, great to have a mixing board and cables and mics and stands and everything else. But if you're just trying to make a quick and dirty uh, recording of what's going on in your classroom, I'd like to suggest picking up a USB microphone, something that you can plug directly into the computer and record straight on. I just did a quick web search and came up with this one from Audio Technica. I don't have a model number, but I'm sure you can find it as easily as I did. And it's 60 bucks. Has lots of bells and whistles to it. It works, it does the job, and you don't have to deal with all those cables and everything and the mixing board. You go right to your computer with that. Um, now, freebies. Get to the app store. There's pitch pipes and tuners and metronomes and lots of things for your smartphone that are out there and available that will cost you nothing. All of the different platforms that are available, that's a really good way to find some Monday morning money makers. So the big part about this is, as Mr. Berkeley indicated, that the tech is the tool. It's not the be all and end all of the program. You're an artist. You need to be creative. You need to look at the things that are going to help you work your program. So beg, borrow, but don't steal. Talk to the other people in your district. Maybe there's three high schools in your district, and last year somebody got a whole big grant for a whole bunch of technology that hasn't even made it out of the box. Talk to them. See if you could borrow some of that from them. Hey, I'd like to use that this year. You know, we, we have that in our school and use it for a year and see what we can do with it. That would be a really great way to save you some money by finding out the things that are already in and around you. Something that can work in somebody else's school can certainly work in your school, and it doesn't have to be the latest, greatest in order to be a good tool that you can make use of in your classroom. The other thing I'd like to indicate to you is it's very important as creative people that we keep working on our craft. Spend 20 minutes a day. I know time is terribly difficult to come by, but spend 20 minutes a day working on your craft. In the afternoons before I teach after school lessons or rehearsals, I sit and have a cup of coffee. I'm sure a lot of us do that. And so I take that 20 minutes. Maybe I watch a TED Talk to get a little bit of inspiration, something that's going to make me want to do more. You can watch one by our own Jay Berkman. He's got a great TED Talk out on there, The Revolution of Education. It's something worth your time. Surf the web and get some free downloads. There's a lot of music that's out there in the public domain now that is available in PDF form on the internet that will save you money again. And that 20 minutes could inspire you to find other things as well. Find someone who does your job better than you. Now, I know, I know, in this room, there's nobody that does your job better than you. But find somebody that does. Talk to them. Get inspired by them. Find out what it is that makes them tick and how you can draw from that. And finally, help someone else. Maybe you're that veteran teacher that has uh, somebody who's uh, relatively less experienced that's working with you. You need to give them the, the benefit of your wisdom and your experience. Or maybe that rookie teacher who uh, has taken all of the technology courses that your university provided and someone who's been teaching 20 years has no idea that this brave new world that we're entering on. You can help them. None of us is as smart as all of us. And you know more than you think. So share that with somebody. Your artists, be creative. Now I'm gonna turn it over to our friend Martin Dimitrov for our next segment. Good morning, I'm Martin Dimitrov, and I teach orchestra at the village school, fourth grade to 12th grade. Before I start my segment on tips and tricks, I would like to pass something to you. It's a violin and a bow for your viewing pleasure, and as you're examining, I'll tell you more about it. When I was five years old and I wanted to play the violin, I asked my mom, can I play it? She said, well, yes, but the only thing that you can say, I can't do it or I give up. So I try to exhaust all the possibilities and I usually find a solution, sometimes unexpected. 
If you take a closer look at that violin, it has been super glued. And the bow too, by the way. <laughs> One afternoon, me and my friend decided to try and to see what's going to happen. And the funny thing, because we did such a poor job, because we really didn't expect anything to come out of it, but it did. And instead of being in the trash, those can still be used by a student. So my message to you is, if you look hard enough, you will usually find a solution. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I would like to share another tip with you. For the longest time, ever since I started teaching, I've been looking for a way to make my students move their ball between the bridge and the fingerboard, stay in one place. One day, I just took a sharpie and I colored the string, one inch of the string between the fingerboard and the bridge, every string, and I handed that violin back to the student. It worked pretty well. Then, I did it for another student, and also worked. It gave the student a visual representation and reinforcement of what I asked them to do, and also a guide to self-direction at home. Now, I don't assume that there are any um, string manufacturing company people here who are super astro. Why am I telling you this? Well, because it's all on YouTube. I posted in a section for tips and tricks. And now, I would like to introduce Ms. Lip, who is our man. So my name is Marilyn Lip, and I teach first, second, and third grade violin class. At our school, we have a group violin class, so 20 kids will come in, and they come to me for 30 minutes uh, sorry, 45 minutes, twice a week. Last year it was 30 minutes, but you know, schedules. So I'm going to tell you about YouTube, and what I discovered was YouTube is really, really neat. I've been using it with my students. I take tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of videos, and I love YouTube. It was not my favorite thing at first, but what I've been able to do is I've actually, mine is called Tech Savvy String, so it's www.youtube dot com slash user slash tech savvy strings and on my youtube channel i actually have tips and tricks sort of like what martin has on his i have technology tools i have teacher tools i have games that you can play with the kids they also do vocal music at our school which is what mrs Grab teaches and so we work closely together and our normal program as well with mr uh, brian callahan so in our class we do a lot of singing i've got singing tools i've got technology tools of how to actually start your YouTube. I'm not going to get into how you start a YouTube, but if you go to my channel, I've made a video so that you can actually see how to do it and walk through the steps of going to get your YouTube channel set up. On the side, it's pretty cool because you can change. Um, I'm sorry. So teacher tricks. On the side, you can actually connect sort of to your family members. So these are my other teacher family, so you can get links to other people's YouTube. So let's say you have a YouTube that you really want me to add to my family. Send me um, an email, and I'd be happy to add you to the side, and then you can connect with the people that I'm already connected with, which is really, really neat. YouTube was scary at first a little bit because putting a camera in the classroom was kind of scary for me, but as you notice, we've got, actually got cameras all around because we do a ton of video recording all the time. And we've noticed that only good things can come from it. It's a way to advocate for your program. It's a way for kids to come in and assess the work they've done. They'll watch themselves playing. They'll watch the other class in third grade playing. They'll watch me playing. I'll play the song on violin or I'll play it on piano. So now that they can actually practice at home and they don't all have violin. So if you would please mirror me. Take your uh, left arm like this, please. Take your other arm, thank you. Do, re, mi. Do, re, mi, fa. Do, re, mi, fa. Do, re, mi, fa, so, so, so. Do, re, mi, fa, so, so, so. So if you're a violinist and you don't have a violin at home, you can practice the arm violin with Miss Lips Play Along YouTube channel videos. And also, now the kids are YouTube stars, so they're really into watching themselves. I actually practiced it 
in the class because I wanted to see if I could use it for when I subbed. I put the video up for my sub, who's not a music person and has no idea how to play the violin or the piano. So I put it up for them to watch to see how they responded to it. And they were like glued to it, way more glued to it than me being there physically. And I was a little insulted, but I was like, okay, whatever, as long as my sub can play this and I'm in the classroom, so now I have a sub. And it's really, it's been so awesome because it's advocating for my program with parents, administrators who have no idea what we're doing. And it's also advocating for my other people's program and we get to share stuff together. The last thing I would say in order to get started, check out my YouTube channel. Also check with administrators to see if you're allowed to put students on a YouTube channel online. We have a thing that they had to sign at the beginning of the year. So check to make sure that that's okay and start teaching videos. And there's videos on my YouTube of how to upload them to your channel as well in order to get started. The next person I'm gonna turn it over to is Mr. Demetra. And that's all I'm gonna say about YouTube. It's awesome, YouTube is awesome. You should get one. Hello again. As an educator, I'm constantly looking for new and better ways to maximize my impact in uh, the classroom by using differentiated learning, targeted learning, and multiple approaches to teaching. My goal is to give more and better personal attention to as many students as possible. And you know how difficult that is from behind the conductor staff. When proximity is an issue, technology, in this case, the practicing software called Smart Music, allows me to get into the classroom, be between the students, and offer valuable personal instruction to maximize my impact. I would like to play a video for you now to see how the first five minutes of class go. Hello, this is Martin Dimitra. It's five minutes before class, I have set up a finger twister on smart music and I'm expecting fourth grade to come in very quickly. They will set up the room and they will start practicing this while I tune their instruments in the beginning of class. Enjoy.
And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that and get onto some strategies that will let you know a little bit about the pros, a little bit about the cons, and a little bit about the takeaway so that you can have a little bit more of this experience than that experience. I was dragged kind of kicking and screaming into the world of smart music, and when I came out of the village school, I was told that we are a smart music campus, and we were going to do smart music, by gum. And uh, I had messed around with it about 10 years ago and had a very unsatisfying experience, and uh, I've become kind of an advocate of it now, and I'm gonna tell you why. So first, a few of the things that are great about it. 36 bucks a year, it's an annual subscription. It's subscription-based. For that 36 bucks a year, you get on, in, in the program, some practice tools. There's a tuner, metronome, an on-screen keyboard, a practice timer, which can be very, very helpful for you to keep track of the different timings of things. There are recording capabilities that are right in the program. Yesterday, yesterday, I was recording the parts for Mr. Sandman for my girls who are doing solo and ensemble because they were not being successful in their practice. And could I please play it for them? I didn't have time to set things up. I didn't, I've got the nice equipment. I didn't have time. I just pulled out my computer, set, smart, set it on the keyboard, went right into smart music, recorded the part at the piano with the headphones on and the click track running, and then saved it and exported it as an MP3 that I emailed all four parts to that girl. When she showed up at 11.15 to class that morning, I said, I've emailed it to you. She pulled out her cell phone and said, oh, there they are. Then she proceeded to email the other three parts to the other three girls and they were ready to practice. That's worth 36 bucks to me right there. It also has access to methods and materials repertoire library, and there's a lot of sight reading exercises in there. It's really good stuff that you can use every day. Much of which you probably already have on the shelf in hard copy, but now you can project it and you can have the whole class working on it all at once. There's a repertoire library that you can have as well. There's some solo literature in there that you can use, and it's better for instrumental than it is for vocal. So, oops, wrong way. Um, another thing that hit me on this was when I had a colleague discussion uh, at a recent event, and he said that in the first year of smart music in his classroom, the students hated it because it made them accountable. In the second year, they kind of got the message and learned to love it because it made them accountable. Students want to be accountable for their effort. They want to be able to chart their progress. They want to be able to know that they are growing and learning with their music. For the teacher side of it, we also have a degree of accountability. It's a wonderful thing for us to be able to create a portfolio of standards-based learning and recordings to illustrate, illustrate the progress that the students are making. When your inspector general walks into the room, and doesn't your blood pressure go up when that happens, and they have no idea what's going on, but they, hey, that sounds kind of nice, hey, good job. Hey, hey. But you can say, look, I want you to hear where they started on this piece. And you can play them a recording from two, three months ago, or two, three weeks ago, or two or three days ago, and let them see that progression of learning that's taking place. It's really great for helping you advocate for your program as well. Now, some of the cons, some of the things that, Ah, thank you. <laughs> Dueling clickers here. The repertoire library is great for instrumentalists, but it is lousy for choir. I'm a choir director, and this is my principal frustration. Uh, one of the guys at Smart Music Tech Support knows me when I call uh, because I'm on them constantly about adding choral repertoire. We need choral repertoire as well. It is extremely limited in terms of that because there isn't any. There is some solo repertoire for boys. You can find the 24 Italian songs and arias and other things you use for soloists, which will help you for solo and ensemble kind of stuff. But the choral repertoire is absent. So if you're an instrumentalist, you will find things that are useful to you, uh, but they have yet to get that required. I'm a Sibelius guy, tried and true. I'm not a Finale guy. And uh, Smart Music has a proprietary relationship with Finale, and there are lots and lots and lots of hoops you can jump through but they're very difficult. So if you're a member of the Sibelius clan like me, that's going to be a challenge that you're going to face. There's also a lack of linkage between the on-screen uh, music that you would play or sing and linkage to get to the publisher so that you can actually buy the hard copies because that's something we really want to encourage so that people aren't breaking those copyright laws. And if they had a linkage, click a button, go to J.W. Pepper or Hal Leonard or whoever and find that piece, whoever the publisher is, to go to their page and actually make the purchase. So those are some of the things that may be a little bit challenging to be working with the program. 
what are the takeaways? Well, the takeaway is get it anyway. Get it anyway, 36 bucks a year, 10 cents a day. Can you really afford not to have all those tools available to you? Do you really need to have that tuner, that metronome, all of those pieces that are found in there, sitting around and having to go through when you've got it in one place on the screen, where you can work those exercises with the kids on a projector, where you can do all of that stuff in the classroom, and boy, do their faces light up when they do an accessible exercise together, and they see 94% jump up at the top of the screen, and they go, wow! It's fantastic that way. Use it for a year in your classroom as the teacher. See what happens when your more advanced students want to get involved in that. And yeah, okay, you can have that. The little Tom Sawyer whitewashing the fence. Yeah, okay, you can get a, you, I will allow you to get a subscription for yourself, top students. And then see what happens in the second year when all the others see how fast they're progressing as they're learning and working with that as well. So I would say that the benefits are obvious. You're going to progress your program for 36 bucks a year. Despite some challenges, I don't think you're going to find something better to give you some maximum energy in your technology. Thank you very much. And I believe Mr. Berkeley. So I'm going to take just two minutes and talk a little bit about something that's really important that we don't do enough of, which is moving your program. Um, you can imagine probably most of you are in this room because something about music excited you at some point. Whether it was your middle school director or high school person or somebody in college that made you believe in you, what we have to constantly endeavor to do is to move our program. So I'm going to show you a really quick video um, that will demonstrate how I spent about 15 minutes trying to move my program. So as a director uh, of a fine arts program at a school, I'm constantly trying to find ways to get you to fall in love with what we do. So we do a lot of things in the community. We do tons of community service. We play out, as it was referred to earlier, we play for the, the Dynamo, the Astros, the, the, the Texans, the, 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 the different uh, sporting groups in town. We've also done a number of charity opportunities. So rather than talk about that, rather than sending an email, I created a video. And, and even more so, what I did is I put a fun little soundtrack on it. The soundtrack was free. I downloaded it from GarageBand. This whole thing took me less than 20 minutes. And all of it's legal, and all of it's on our YouTube channels, and I encourage you to take it and use it. So check this out. While this is happening, I can also put my message up there. Don't forget the fundraiser coming up. Don't forget there's a special concert happening. It's very visually engaging. I can throw lots of things on the top if I want. And I can send this out. More importantly, my students can send it out. I can make it a challenge. Hey guys, let's try to get 500 YouTube clicks today. I can send it out to my administrative team. I can send it out to other schools that we want to partner with. Nothing too fancy about it. I get the pictures from students. I get pictures from parents. I've got my phone on me all the time. As you can see, we're kind of geeks when it comes to the cameras. I just put this stuff together. I don't overthink it. You know, maybe I should have cropped this kid out. Maybe this one should have been in there. Maybe that angle. I'm not thinking that far ahead. I'm trying to make my program exciting. I'm trying to make it to the students. The parents, everyone involved in the community wants to be a part of what we're doing, right? We're spending hours and hours a week. Most of us put in 50 or 60 hours a week. Why not get more at mileage out here? This sort of thing can help you. And it's sometimes it gets to the bottom of the list because it's not urgent. But it's very, very important. In a minute and a half, I've shown you four months of things. I've shown you grades 3 through 12. I've shown you all the different musical ensembles. And at the very end, I'm going to throw a little sweet spot. These are our region folks. And then whatever the big news is, I'm going to throw it up there. Check your calendar, you know, send the band director a check for money, something along these lines. So now I'll introduce the next person, but don't forget, move your program. Hello again. Um, I would like to tell you how it all started. It started two and a half years ago, I remember. Uh, my fourth and fifth grade orchestra were doing the Sandra Darko arrangement of William Tell. And I really wanted to help my beginning and struggling students. So what I did is I created YouTube videos at a slow, medium, and fast speed for the students to play along. Now, I am a violinist and definitely not a cellist, a bassist. I, the total time that I played since I got the job was probably about half an hour on each instrument. Take a look at my posture. But um, I took every single instrument and I posted it on YouTube. It was way better than nothing. And my students really liked it. Mr.
Mr. D didn't mind at all repeating himself. He didn't uh, get upset uh, uh, for saying the same thing over and over again. He didn't lose patience, just rewind me. <laughs> now I'd like
Use your camera, take a snapshot of your students in the classroom and let them see what they look like. Imagine what that would be for them. Sometimes I might put the video camera on and hook it up, to, or the, the, the camera on my computer and hook it up and turn it around and project them on the screen so they see what they actually look like at that moment. So you can get them from this kind of posture. Which would, sorry. Thank you. Which would look like that if they had folders in their hands. There's texting posture with the folders. And then here's somebody who's texting and someone who's holding a folder in a decent way. And then this is something that can help turn this around. You can get everybody to realize what they're doing. They see themselves. They see what you've been telling them, and they start to believe it when they see it with their own eyes. So the tech can be fun. This can be something that they can actually get a kick out of, and especially if you have a good sense of humor about it. Um, there are many times when I will say, um, can somebody Google that for me real quick? Oh, my God. Right? Uh, yeah, well, when, when was Schumann? What were Schumann's things? Can uh, somebody get that on Wikipedia for me real quick? Bam! Just any little thing. It's a way of meeting the students where they are. And you're giving them permission to do it in a positive way for the classroom rather than having it be something negative. This is going to only increase as the technology becomes more and more prevalent in their lives and as we continue to oh, I'm sorry to say, and it will fall farther and farther behind, but meeting them where they are is a very, very important aspect of what we do. That picture can be worth a thousand words. Let's see if we can do that with our kids. They love it too. All right, let's see. Back to Ms. Liv. So I'm going to talk to you about this program, Man in the Box. If you're not familiar with it, it's actually a thing that jazz musicians sometimes use because it's hard to get a rhythm section together. So they've created these like electronic sounds, and it's really, really neat. I obviously don't use it for the jazz portion in my classroom, but what I do use it for is I can make easy one by one pattern songs with my little first, second, third graders. So I can create the chords, uh, type them in as I want. I can create a loop track so that I can have it repeat like a zillion times. I can also make my own accompaniment, accompaniment styles. So we're gonna listen to the Mary Had a Little Lamb Jazz. So we do these like pizzicato or arco with the bow. I've also got another one that we use, a little more rock and roll when we're feeling like we need to get it going. And then the last one is actually one that um, the marimba teacher uses. He does all of his students in uh, C, because the marimbas that we have are in C, but violins don't really touch C major for a while. So I transposed it because you can transfer, and there's like a transpose button on the top. Really, really simple. There are so many bells and whistles of this program that I don't even understand, but I use it for the most basic thing. But most importantly, what I use it for is improvising. So I'll have my chord progression playing. This is like the fiddle version, so we get a little more fiddly violin or whatever. And I'll have this chord progression playing when they enter the room. So they're actually coming in right away, and they have this think time or noodle time to practice and try out things on instruments that they don't normally get to do. Try really these scribbly bows and try really woo, bows on this, and we'll hear that a little bit later. But also what we do with this is we use the same chord progression, we'll play like a scale pattern. So now we can do around the world. So one person would be responsible for do, and they can change the rhythm pattern on do. Then the next person in tempo would play re, and the next person would play fa, pizzicato, arco, arco, whatever you want to do. You can trade twos, so they can do duets together. And we're actually, I'm going to show you an example of how I first introduced it. So can I have some non-violinists? Imagine yourself as a second grader. Any, any volunteers? I'll take violinists too, if you're, I need some volunteers. Um, so we're going to do, yeah, come on down, grab a violin, we've got some. So I'm going to show you exactly as I would teach it to my kids. Who wants a super good violin? Anybody? <laughs> Thank you. 
And we were rounding the corner, and you guys have been a fantastic audience this morning. Thank you so much. Help me give a round of applause to the my friends. I'm going to share one final thing. And I think this is for me personally the most important in my home. I've got three little girls. Uh, there's only one rule you're not allowed to say, I can't. Because I actually believe there's always a way if you want it bad enough. And so, what I'm going to talk to you today at the end of our session here is get a vision. What do you really want? What do you have? What do you need? But what do you want? Why did you start doing what you do? I'm going to share with you a dream that a few of us had, and I'm going to thank the people that helped make it because they're here in the room as well. Um, there were a lot of reasons that what you're going to see should never have happened. Lots of reasons. The first being that it cost us in the end about $30,000. Um, in addition to that, there wasn't enough room. In addition to that, well, we don't have room in the schedule. And in addition to that, there were 50 other reasons why this project should never have even been taught. But now it's a staple part of our diet at the school. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little bit in a video, you can go ahead and start it. We came to TMEA three years ago, and we heard something that just blew our minds away. There were these beautiful marimbas that were coming from uh, an educator in Washington State, uh, Mr. Walt Hampton, and we said, oh, 
Anyone ever seen the Regari Ensemble? A few of us? Great. Blew our minds. So we said, all right, we're in the band. I'm going to leave back to Houston. How do we do it? What do we do? That's what we had. Didn't look anything like what we had, but all right, we're going to start somewhere. So we got volunteers. We told the third grade kids in our school, anyone that comes in the morning for two weeks, we'll have rehearsal, we'll have donuts, you'll see some juice in the back there. Anyone that wants to come, you don't need to know how to play it. I had no idea what to do with marimba. I just didn't really like it. So again, we're not going to let anything get in the way. So we rehearsed for a couple weeks. How do we rehearse? How do three of us get together and rehearse? What do we do? What music do we do? Let's set a goal. We're going to do a concert. So two weeks later, we said this stuff, all right, we're going to do something, you know, we'll make it real fun, parents will clap no matter what, because they're going to be great. And we did this. These kids hadn't played a note two weeks before. Like to do this. And I think one of the things that energizes us that probably energizes you 
is doing more of it and seeing the success. Your children are gonna to wanna to do it more, you're gonna be more excited, and in the process, you're gonna get a ton of support. So before we say goodbye, can I have Angie and Brian stand up? They were the two courts that helped me with this a couple years ago. And also my friends stand up. Thank you so much for being a great audience. Stick on these ones now. Have a great time with you. Thank you so much. We got a little blooper reel if you want to watch. Uh, uh.